Good evening. Welcome, everyone. My name is Clarence Reynolds. I'm the director at the Center for Black Literature at Medgar Evers College. And I want to welcome you to our John Oliver Killings reading series this evening. It's an evening with author Ewan Akpan. As the center continues to celebrate the uh, literature of writers of the African diaspora, we are actually, we're absolutely delighted to have Mr. Akpan with us this evening. He is a Nigerian born writer and he is the author of the critically acclaimed short story collection, Say You're One of Them. This evening, he will be in conversation with the author and Center for Black Literature staff member, Donna Hill, who's a, who's a professor at Megar Everest College. Before we begin the program, I wanna thank our sponsors of the program, the African American Literature Book Club. I also wanna thank the Amazon, Liter Liter Amazon Literary Partnership I also want to give thanks to Aaron Levitt at WW Norton for assisting with putting on this, getting this program together. But before we begin the program, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Brenda Green. Dr. Green is the, uh, direct, the executive director of the Center for Black Literature. Dr. Green is a scholar, educational leader, author, literary activist, and radio host. She is professor of English, founder and executive director, director of the Center for Black Literature, and director of the National Black Writers Conference at Megervis College. Her educational leadership, professional accomplishments, and scholarship includes essays, grants, book reviews, and presentations in African American literature, composition, and multicultural literature. She's the editor of African Presence and Influence on the Cultures of the Americas, and co editor of Resistance and Transformation Conversations with Black Writers. She is the host of Writers on Writing radio program that airs on. WNYE 95.5 FM, 95 FM Mega Rivers Radio on Sunday evenings, 7 to 7.30 PM. Welcome, Dr. Green. Thank you so much, Clarence. And welcome, UM Akpon, Donna Hill, the Mega Rivers College community, faculty and staff of Mega Rivers College, Mega Rivers College friends, and our Center for Black Literature Advisory Board members. I'd like to give a special welcome to our program partners and supporters, the Amazon Literary Partnership, and our program bookseller, Troy Johnson of the African American Literature Book Club, who's carrying the book online, and I encourage you to purchase that book. I also would like to thank the Megervis College Office of Communications and the Megervis College Office of Academic Affairs. And of course, we could not do this without our Center for Black Literature team, our staff and our consultants, Clarence Reynolds, our director, Amber Magruder, the project manager, April Silver, the marketing and communications director, Leah Bird, the communications and marketing associate, Simone Wow Manning, our virtual events manager. And also, of course, our interviewer and moderator, Donna Hill, who is an accomplished writer herself with dozens of books. We're really looking forward to this conversation. The Center for Black Literature is committed to ensuring that the work and voices of writers throughout the African diaspora are sustained and promoted. And we're very excited that in 2022, we will be celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Center for Black Literature. Our programs also include, of course, the National Black Writers Conference, and Symposia, the John Oliver Killens Reading Series, which is being held tonight, the Killens Review of Arts and Letters, our journal, the Dr. Edith Rock Writers Workshop uh, for Elder Writers, our Writers on Writing Radio program, which airs on WMYE. And you can also watch videos of our programs on our YouTube station, which is at the Center for Black Literature.org. We encourage our student writers also to submit blogs to our website under student musing. So I encourage you visit our Center for Black Literature to get more information. I am really looking forward to this conversation with UM Akpan. I had an opportunity earlier to interview him on the Writers on Writings program. And I was so impressed with the book which raises so many issues that people can relate to. New York, My Village, um, 
describes depictions of African, the African immigrant experience, the publishing industry and its whiteness, colorism among blacks, hypocrisy in the church. Um, UM is concerned with truth telling and he does it in a satirical way. And as I said, when I talk to him, he does not leave any stone unturned. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your support. You also support our writers by purchasing their books. And I encourage you to donate to the Center for Black Literature. We appreciate your donations. No amount is too small. So stay tuned for a stimulating discussion this evening and be sure to have your questions ready after this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green. Indeed, it is a very, it's a very enlightening book and I recommend that everyone go to AfricanAmericanLiteraturebookClub.com and purchase uh, Mr. Akpan's book, New York, My Village. I'd like to introduce you to our, uh, to Donna Hill, I like to say, uh, who's been a real supporter of the Center for Black Literature for eons and she's also a uh, writer in her own right. Donna's latest novel is Confessions in B-Flat. She has more than 80 published titles to her credit since her first novel was released in 1990. She is one of the early pioneers of the African-American romance genre. Three of her novels have been adapted for television. Her awards include the Career Achievement Award, the Trailblazer Award, the Zora Neale Hurston Literary Award, and the Gold Pen Award. Don is also an assistant professor of professional writing at Megaverse College. She can be found at www.donnahill.com. I'm happy to call her a friend and a colleague and an avid reader. Happy to have you on board, Donna. Good to see you. Donna, there she is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. How are you're you? More than, you're more you. than welcome. Now I would like to introduce you to our featured guest, Mr. Yuan Akpan, who was born in Ikat Akpan Ada in Nigeria. I, can't, I don't want to mess too many of their names up. Yuan now teaches creative writing at the University of Florida in Gainesville. He's the author of the celebrated short story bestseller, Say You're One of Them, which was published in 2008. Uh, Say You're One of Them was the 2009 Oprah Book Club selection. It also won the Commonwealth Prize in African region, the Open Book Prize, the Hurston Wright Legacy Award, <clears throat> and many others. Mr. Akpan has been a fellow at the Black Mountain Institute at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, at the Institute for the Humanities, the Yaddo Foundation, and the Coleman Center of New York Public Library. He's also been a fellow at the Hang Center for Catholic Intellectual Heritage in Chicago. UM short stories and autobiographical pieces have appeared in The New Yorker, Oprah Magazine, and other publications. Please welcome UM Akpan, and he'll be in conversation with Donna Hill. Enjoy the program. Hello, hello, welcome, <laughs> welcome. I am so excited, okay, because I'm a newly minted fan. And so I totally love the book. Um, I laughed, I was mad, I was crazy, and I was illuminated as well. So I went through the whole gamut. And the copy of my, of my book, if, if I was one of your students, I would definitely get an A because my book is a battlefield of line notes and post-its. So it's all marked up. <laughs> um, but before I even get into all of the questions that I have, uh, why don't you tell us just a little bit about uh, the novel, um, New York, My Village. Just give us a sense of what it's about and your main character, Econ. Okay. Uh, you want me to give you like a short summary of the novel? Yeah, just give us okay. an idea of okay. what it's about. Yes, yes, yes. So um, first of all, thank you, Clarence Reynolds, for the uh, wonderful introduction. Thank you for uh, Dr. Brenda. Um, thank you to all our, uh, our audience. Thank you for finding time to be here. Um, Donna, I've already said it before. I don't know how you manage to write so many books. You know, I, I <laughs> big congratulations. 
<laughs> it seems to me you also read a lot of books. So I, I have to come to you for lessons at some point. Okay. Um, my book is about someone from my ethnic group in Nigeria, the Anans, coming to New York City to live in New York for four months. He is an editor in Nigeria. So he's coming to understudy a publishing house in New York City so he can you know, do better back home. <clears throat> um, the thing is, he comes with a 600 page anthology of war stories from his own minority group and other groups. Um, the war stories are about the Biafran War of 1967 to 1970. Um, we were in Biafra, but the world doesn't know that Biafra had more than 30 tribes, ethnic groups, the Igbos have been the dominant group. Um, God has blessed them. They have powerful writers. So they got their war stories out for the 50 years. That's what the world has known. Us minorities, we've not been that fortunate. We've tried, but we've not been that fortunate. So he's trying to edit these stories into an anthology. Um, in New York City, he meets racism, racism everywhere, in publishing, in the church. Um, so he tries to, to figure this out. Imagine if you're arriving in New York City and you live there for just four months. That's not even enough time to understand how this powerful, wonderful whirlwind of a city is. By the way, I'm speaking to you from New York City. I am around the financial district, I mean, a hotel, <laughs> okay? Um, anyway, this is what he has come to do in New York City, and he runs into all these, you know, stumbling blocks and tries to reconcile, to connect, to be a human being. He's patient, he's kind. Sometimes he, he's so angry, he, you know, but there's a lot of conversations in his head because when you're a minority, you cannot say everything that is going wrong. Uh, so that's right. the story. He's got bed box in the midst of this. Um, <laughs> yes, we are definitely going to be talking about that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when 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 I was reading when I was reading your novel, it um, it brought to mind um, Adishi's novel Half a Yellow Sun. Um, yes. And yes, because she also has the Biafran War as yes. her backdrop. But then the other war is the family, the turmoil in the family and what's, what's going on with all of those individuals. And in your novel, war is the thread as well. And you throw in race and religion, which are always contentious. Um, but why publishing? Why publishing as this, as this other war? Donna, as you are saying that, there's this smile that is refusing to leave your face <laughs> because you know better than me that the place is racist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you have We're so many books. It. We're going to explain it for everybody that doesn't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is what happened. I, when my first book um, was being sold, it went into an auction and 12 publishers jostled for it. This gave me a chance to go into many publishing houses and I would go in and it's a very wide space. Mm -hmm. So imagine I'm in New York City, it's very diverse and I get into this building and it's all white people. So <laughs> the shock of it, <laughs> I said that smile will become a big laugh at a point. You know, the shock of it. And that was not all. Um, then I would run into a minority from time to time. They would be so shocked. It's like they weren't even to run away from me, you know, as if they had no permission to even talk to me. They did not expect that I would be there. So these things registered. And I said to myself, one day I will write about this. 
um, about that experience. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. Um, Those, it, 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 it's yeah. interesting because um, you know one of the one of the things that um, that you that you bring up and, I, and I'll talk about in, in a little bit is you know this whole idea of you know we have to be diverse and we're going to be diverse, um, but that's that's a whole other story. But one of the books that um, your character Econ reads in his role as this fellow who won the Tony Morrison Fellowship, which is like, <laughs> can we really win one of those? That's what I wanted to know. Um, so there's one of no the books, award like that. <laughs> it's one fiction of the books, now. Yeah, yeah, one of the books that he has to read is um, Trails of Tuskegee. So and when I was thinking about, um, you know, the fictionalized content of this novel and reading it through, um, it draws a connection between Biafra and Tuskegee and the long-term effects that linger, right? Mm -hmm. So Econ is working on this war anthology, which you mentioned in your opening. Um, and um, he has to, what he has to read made me think about the choices we often have to make as writers. Um, in order to make our Black horror palpable to the audience. So talk a little bit about why you selected Tuskegee to perhaps illuminate the, I, that idea. Yeah, um, it wasn't a very, it wasn't a, a, a complicated choice um, because even as a Black, person who is not even an American. Each time I go into the hospital, a clinic, something hits mm -hmm. me. What am I getting? You know, am I a subject of an experiment? You know, it hits mm -hmm. me. So I was like, like, okay, this, it might be worse for the descendants of the Tuskegee victims. You know, um, also I wanted to create in this book a comparison, the histories of violence between the two countries, because mm -hmm. I did not want Americans to say, look at those Africans. Why, they're always fighting. They're always fighting over something. Why can't they stop fighting? And then, they say, oh, look at the African-Americans. That's where mm -hmm. they came from. That's why they're dysfunctional. Daddy, 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 daddy. So I wanted to say, okay, we have we had the Biafran war. Um, and then you have other wars here. Suddenly our government, the government of your country decides to single out the black men of Tuskegee and fry their dicks for 40 years. Okay, mm -hmm. so how could you now mm -hmm. sit here and blame us in Africa for, for wars? You have your wars here. And what does it mean to be an African American? You are carrying this weight of 400 years of you know, slavery, of crime to be heard. Okay, and then the Native Americans. Yeah. 60 million of them were killed so that this land could be taken away from them. Okay, the sharecroppers, they were lynched on trees. Some trees, sometimes a tree will have like 10 people hanging like Christmas decorations. Yeah, so, strange fruit. Yeah, yeah. So, so we in America are not in a position to point fingers and say, why are you always fighting? Why is it dysfunctional? We, if we've done worse things to people out there and even in here. So that's mm -hmm. where that was coming from. So I'm coming up with an album of the wars. America has fought against itself. And then this war, we have fought against ourselves in Nigeria. So that's what I was trying to, that's how that came about. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So you answered my question. Good, good, good. So, you know, um, as, as, as writers, um, you know, we always select um, a variety of elements to um, symbolize and serve as metaphors for bigger ideas and themes. Um, some are very obvious and some are not. 
Um, so you made some choices as well. Um, and, and one of the things that I'd like you to talk a little bit about is your character, Dr. Hughes, um, who sort of represents that, that whole um, um, internal hatred that we have sometimes for ourselves, the whole colorism um, mm -hmm. and the events in the church. Like the church is supposed to be, you know, I was looking, <laughs> I was reading about the church. And I was like, oh God. <laughs> This is like a black funeral, um, you know, like everybody was just like, was going, I was like, really, it's a church. But yeah. um, so can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, Dr. Hughes and his representation of, you know, colorism as an example, as well as the events that happen in the church um, that explore the hypocrisy of religion? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, uh, some of us, black people, <laughs> Some of us have become white. We are like Oreo. You know, the black has become a, just the external of this thing. Um, and sometimes it's in a bit to, to belong to the power structure so that you do well, so that you get a job, uh, so that you don't rock the boat. <clears throat> so some of us have become like that. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And if we can, we, you know, we would like to get rid of this black body so that nobody could even smell that we were once black. And it's not just some of us in the African-American community, some of us back in Africa, we are like, you know, a lot of us are like that. Um, so so the, the energy that comes from the Western world is so powerful, if you're not, careful, it will evacuate even your culture. You forget your culture, you forget everything. Our local languages are dying. Everybody is speaking English. Uh, Mandarin is becoming big now in the world because of China. <clears throat> so it's very easy for one to forget his uniqueness, her uniqueness, their uniqueness, you know, in the big mm -hmm. to belong mm -hmm. and this world of uh, the glo globalization means whose culture will be accepted, whose body, whose style, you know, whose gender, you know, you were having all these, you know, fights. So this was big, you know, in my mind. And I know many, uh, many people from Africa who have come here and they've refused to visit home. That's Africa, they, they, they said, we're done. We're staying here. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to create a character that, you know, shows that, that kind of existence. Um, that's where that uh, um, came from. And the thing okay. in the church is I, I, was, I was a Catholic priest. I was a seminarian in this country. I, so I ministered to many groups as a Catholic priest. Um, I know about racism in the church. Uh, I know about you know, it's in a way maybe perhaps others, when, when it is in the church, when it is in the sacristy, it's very shocking. Uh, the Catholic hierarchy in this country is very white. The Catholic hierarchy in the world is very white because it goes to Rome, okay? If you look at it that for 400 years, only white people could be, only Italians, and then white people could be, where is that black pope? Where is he going to come from? When you don't have the block that votes for you, the Holy Spirit will find it very difficult to negotiate this because you actually have people voting. Okay, so there is, you know, there is that. Um, I have always wanted Donna to create an iconic church scene, something as pungent perhaps like the scenes in The Godfather you know, those baptism scenes. Um, you are laughing. <laughs> yes, I wrote something down in, the, in, in, in my notes on the side, like mafia. Yes. <laughs> it's yes. in my notes. Yes, I've always wanted to create something like this. So luckily, this was my, my chance. Um, and if I'm honest, I have been to a church before and everyone sat very far away from me. I was the only black. 
It was in the middle of Nebraska. People sat away from me. Um, they giggled at me, they looked at me, you know, they, you know, so I was very uncomfortable. So I know of that feeling. I know of stories of fellow seminarians who were with me, who they went to church and the priest would not shake their hand. So I know of these actual stories. And I wanted to put this, you know, in fiction. And it's very shocking. Um, my teacher, Eileen, you know, Pollock. Um, who has been very helpful to me. When one editor um, did not like that scene and was telling me to cut it out, suggesting strongly that I cut it out, that how could this happen? This is so far from the truth. Um, Eileen was very shocked and said, well, it works. It's a very powerful scene. Why does this need to be cut out? You know, and she's a white person. So why does this need to be cut out? But she went further. She Googled around and actually found a clip of a video, you know, where people took their grandmother to church for burial and a white priest pursued them with the coffin out, got rid of them. You know, he called the police. So later on the diocese of Massachusetts, they apologized to the family. So I was so shocked to see that this has, something like this has actually happened, you know? Yeah. Um, so it helped me to move the story to a whole different level that we are assaulted even in the Holy of Holies, okay? Yeah. And yeah. Donna, you know this more than me. Um, if black people and white people come together in, a, in, a, in church, whose ritualty are we going to use when white people talk about slavery, they are going to refer to Egypt and how God parted the Red Sea and the Jews moved into the desert and the promised land. Black Americans can't go that far. They are going to sing Negro, <laughs> Negro rituals, okay? Mm -hmm. And it will mean the descendants of slaves singing, you know, into the ears of the descendants of slave owners. So are yeah. they going to be able to listen to this, to hear this, to let the African-Americans sing with their painful, pained exuberance? Because that's the spirituality. It consumes them. The slavery is, you know, here now. So, you know, yeah. hence, my understanding of the Catholic Church then is you have Black Catholic churches, St. Clever, you know, Catholic Church, Peter Clever Catholic Church, Benedict the Moore Catholic it's Church, crazy. you know, where the black people will be free now to sing and shiver with the pain of what they're still going through now, okay? Yeah. Um, so it will take a lot for us to come together as a group, you know, and worship. And I, I like to say that if Martin Luther King were a Catholic priest, there's no chance he could have done what he did because the hierarchy stops in Rome. And the mm -hmm. hierarchy in the 60s, even more so than today, was absolutely white. So some order would have come to suspend him, to demonize him, to say he's not patient, he's not following the wisdom of God. Okay. So it was very powerful that the hierarchy of that church, the Baptist church, that you know, Martin Luther King was a part of, began in the black community and stopped in the black community, okay? So that God could speak without having to relay it through a white, you know, body, you know, to Martin Luther King, you know? So, yeah. because religion, as you know, is very powerful. It takes it, yeah. you know, your whole, your whole spirit, body, soul, hope, dream, you know, it's embodied. In, you know, in religion. So that's what I was trying to, yeah. to do, to take this fight into the, into the, onto the table of the Eucharist. Yeah, yeah. And you did an excellent job of this. So anybody, you know, when, you, when you're reading the book, make sure that you highlight that scene when you read it. And one of the other things um, that, that I noticed in terms of uh, the, the symbols and, and, and things that you use, um, food played a major part mm -hmm. in the novel. Um, and yeah. it's not 
just to tease our palates because it's all of these <laughs> wonderful spices and yams and all of this. But how did you use food and, and what, how, did, how did food serve the, the novel? How did, how, did, how did it serve its purpose in the novel? What was, what was your idea? Because it was more than just, let me have my character cook a meal. What, what did you yes. want to do with that? Um, most religion have food at their center. You know, there's always, if there's a religious feast, there's a lot of food. And then for Christianity, there is the bread, there's the wine. Uh, and we say breaking bread together means community. You're mm -hmm. very close to the person. Mm -hmm. You know, every big ceremony we have, you know, there's food, you know, at the center. Because when we meet and if you can eat together with someone, it means a lot. Yeah, Hence, it's almost like a bridge, right? A, a yes. bridge, a way to yes. communicate. Yes, mm -hmm. and hence the expression, eating with the devil with a long spoon, you know? <laughs> so, so um, and I know our food is not very well known in the US, African food, mm -hmm. except Ethiopian food. So our food is not very well known. And that worries me from time to time. In some circles, if you mention African food, you know, people start shaking. It is always as if they're going to eat shit, you know, or stone. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so one of uh -huh. the one of the one of the other things that that I wanted to um, ask you before I ask you to read a, a little excerpt was, um, we I, I mentioned earlier that you know publishing you know especially now is supposed to be touting you know we're all diverse and we're gonna do all of these things and so yeah. this this fictional publishing company is a small company, yeah, and so it, it they tout this mission to be diverse but mm -hmm. the entrenched still <laughs> fight against it, right? So while, um, so while Econ has a, a, a seat at the table, so yes. he's at the table, but he's outnumbered, <laughs> right? He's totally outnumbered. And he talks about the pressure he felt in that space, mm -hmm. having to make a decision on um, the book that was Children of Elijah, uh, of Elijah Moses. And he uh -huh. even asked himself, what am I doing at this table? Like, why uh -huh. am I here? And later he realizes that it was probably the first time that these folks at the table had somebody <laughs> that looked like him in on the deliberations about a black book, the decisions yeah. that they were gonna make. And so like one of the, um, one of the, uh, another book that I read that, that reminded me somewhat of that scenario was um, Zakia Harris's book. And um, it was, it's contemporary kind of like pop culture-y but it's the other black girl. Okay. And it's about, you know, being the only one in the space, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so talk about why it was important to highlight this particular aspect. You touched on it a little bit um, in the publishing world and some of the elements that you use to show this issue in, in publishing. Yes. Um, you know, like what I said a while ago, going into these publishing houses and seeing how white these places were. And I'm like, let me deal with, you know, fiction that, you know, explores this. Um, it's not only f publishing as in publishing that you have this problem because it's so white, all the surrounding suburbs, you know, like agencies, like book distribution, <laughs> They're also very white because these people, their method of recruitment is so private. You know, they're recruiting at birthday right. parties, yeah. you know, uh, birth, uh, children's uh, birthdays. Um, you know, that's how, they, you know. Anyway, I, as a minority, many times I have to keep a poker face. I have to wear a smile, but I'm having a hurricane of conversations 
in my mind, trying to process things very quickly. How do I play the politics to belong? Because I'm alone. Yeah. And it will help my audience also. Women have had to do this kind of thing forever. You know, you are the only woman in this publishing house, in this company, there are hundred men. Um, you're going to try and figure out, okay, how do I play my politics? First of all, to belong because they can easily say, oh, see, she's not sociable. She, she's upset, she's okay. always angry. Let's get rid of her yeah. and get another, you know, you know, these things happen, they'll blame it on you. You know, they say, oh, it's an angry person. You know, she, she never smiles. She's uncomfortable working with men. You know, let's get another woman. So with, you know, with black people, it's the same. They, you know, they're watching you. They say, oh, this person is very uncomfortable. So Ekong knows all of this. And he's trying to make sure he finishes his four months here. Months. <laughs> then, get his four months in. <laughs> <laughs> get his four months in. The only thing that I've been able to cut into those four months are bed bugs. <laughs> okay. Yes, and we're going to talk about the bed bugs after you yeah. read us a short excerpt from your from your novel. Yeah. So Ekom, in that, you know, I was the moment I wrote that chapter, chapter seven, about the publishing, you know, I was so happy because what is happening to Ekom right there and how he tries to fight back. You know, he quickly rearranges his choices and says, okay, I'll let this go. I'll go with this. I'll throw everything behind this, you know, this. Yeah. And making forever, concession. the white publishing world, they have been editing our books. They don't yeah. need to come to Africa to know our culture. They just, you know, they just say whatever you want to say about Africa is fine. It's one big research workshop. You know, whatever you want to say, who cares? Who knows? If you want to say there's something about New York City, they say, no, whoa, 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 whoa. This is not New York. This is not New York. People will not buy this. Uh, America is not like this. So they have been editing yeah. our book, books. Do we have the same power to edit white books? Okay? Right. Um, the conversation that is ongoing now, okay, the, the few editors we have in publishing, it's like their docket is black books. Okay, you handle your black mm -hmm. black stuff. Okay, um, so so Donna, it struck me that these intelligent, smart minority editors, they have no voice in a place that talks about voices. They don't. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that is that's don't. a whole that's a whole other conversation we can have on the side because that yeah. just is, is extremely. Um, you know, uh, deep, <laughs> for lack of a better yeah. word. Yeah. But um, if you could, um, we they want to actually go to audience questions now. So we have some questions from the audience. Um, yeah. So we can take some questions from the audience. And we have to still talk about the bed bugs before you go. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Yuan. Hello, uh, Donna. We do have a question, but I, before I answer the, before we go to the question, well, after we answer this question, Yuan, I, I would like to uh, get you to read a portion, uh, an excerpt from your book. The uh, question comes from Petlin Alexander. She says, "What an example! What is an example of what Africans are doing to stifle Western influences?" Okay, <clears throat> that's a very good uh, question. Um, right now, many ethnic groups are trying to um, boost their local languages, get their children in the diaspora to commit to learning their local languages, like Igbo, like Yoruba, and you know there are a few others. Um, we should do that more. Um, so that's a way of, because if you lose language, you lose so much. Um, so a lot about our food, getting people and our children to, you know, to eat our food, to enjoy our food, uh, our dishes, 
Uh, and then this thing about you know, um, languages, how to get our children both at home and out here to learn our languages. Because I'm telling you, many children in Nigeria don't speak anything but English. Because they live in the big cities, and big cities are very, uh, a lot of the groups have come together, and the only language of understanding is, you know, communication is uh, English. So many people are committing, you know, uh, to this. And then there's a lot being done in music. You know, Nigerian hip hop, for example, has become big. Uh, musicians are becoming world musicians. A lot of these songs carry native, you know, languages, you know, in them. So it's both English and these languages. So it's a very big, it's a very big move. Uh, there are other examples. If I think about them, <clears throat> you know, I will, you know, I will let you, let you know. So I want to um, give you an opportunity to take maybe two minutes or so to read an excerpt um, from your novel. And mm -hmm. then I still have some more questions that I want to ask you before we finish for the evening, OK? OK. Um, when I came to the US for the first time in 1993, I spent two weeks in New York City before I went to Omaha, Nebraska to study. Those two weeks I spent in the Bronx. And I, the Bronx means so much to me. I loved it right away. So in this book, my character goes to the Bronx on page 122. So I'm going to read now. I loved the Bronx. The diversity of people was equally stunning as in Manhattan, but it was intense in a whole different way. The colorful tribes of America were more differentiated. Unlike in the mad rush of our Times Square, here you could see the patterns of color. The overlap, the blur was not as powerful. Where the intensity of Times Square was sometimes like a photo so zoomed in, it lost focus. Here, riding this train, I felt I could take in more, see the colors coming apart in the groups of people moving before me. And when I came into an open space, I looked around frenetically in every direction to see as far as possible before the buildings blocked things out again. As the train continued, I, could, I would have loved to ask the Americans around me whether there was a word to aptly describe what I was seeing, some word that would describe this place and this place alone. But they all looked too serious, avoiding each other's eyes. And then precipitously, I began to see too much graffiti. I could not work out in my head how someone got to spray painting that high wall or the bridge. And when it was weird that though the layout was more open than where I lived in Hell's Kitchen, there was so much trash on the street. And because of Molly's negative comments about the Bronx before I came to America, my mind could not abandon the fear of crime. The more we borrowed into the Bronx, the more I wondered about my safety. I studied the people around me more closely than I would in Manhattan, though I posted the coolest of demeanors with my earphones blasting Two Face, Amaumi, and B of A. As the train began to empty out, I became afraid and moved to the end that was vacant. I texted my village people in the Bronx to tell them where I was. And they said I was on the right track. 
that's it. <laughs> Very nice. I will I will give you a pass, UM, because you should have been talking about Brooklyn, because Brooklyn is the center of the universe, not the You Bronx. should have told me to read from Brooklyn. Yeah, listen. <laughs> for the next book for the next book so um so we have to talk about we have to talk about the bed bugs right um uh -huh. the entire odyssey of the bed bugs is it shifts between hysterical and horrific so but beyond the comic relief of this the, the plight of the bed bugs and econ uh -huh. They clearly represent something more than just the nuisance that they became. So why, why, what, 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 do, what do you see them as, as representing? War, you know, this kind of endless war I've described about the Biafran war. Uh, as soon as I got the idea of bed bugs, I knew it could reflect that, you know, it's today they're killing black people. And just as the world is trying to, 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 to heal from this, then you hear that they are, they've shut down Asians. Asians are now, you know, they're, they're killing them in Atlanta. And then you are trying, oh, they have shot uh, uh, Latinos. And then before you know it, there's mass shooting in some mall and everybody is, you know, affected. Um, so I was looking for something, you know, Donna, I like the movie Jaws because that big shark in the water, what that big shark does to the movie and how they try to, you know, to catch it, to kill it. And it just keeps coming and consuming this human being, biting someone's leg off there. Um, so I wanted something like that in fiction, something that would totally gross out, you know, the reader. Um, it's a serious menace. It's very little. Uh, so sometimes it's annoying because some people say it's too much. You should have just mentioned it twice. Okay. I'm like, are you kidding? When I know New Yorkers who have abandoned their buildings and run away, two people I interviewed, they run away with abandoning everything except their wallets and the clothes they were wearing. They abandoned everything. They fought for three months, four months. They couldn't win. Uh, so, and I had bed box in New York City and they beat me on my two ribs, my, in my left ribs. So I have that direct experience. I figured this out. I was spraying the place nonstop. And <laughs> even when I thought I had won, the fear did not let me stop spraying. The shame. I was working at the New York Public Library, a Coleman fellow, and I was afraid I will export bed box from my room to this World Library, you know, the shame, the fear. And I could not visit my friends anymore because I'm like, okay, how am I sure I don't, this thing is not somewhere in my clothes, you know? So it was very clear in my mind that I had found that shark in the water and it will be bed bugs. And it would also <laughs> talk about how difficult it is to deal with it. Some of these issues, you stop it here, it comes out from the other perspective, other place, you know, we are, you know. So unless we stop all these things together, okay? We are trying to stop racism. After racism, then we stop anti-feminine, you know, patriarchy. We have gotta do all of this together. Everybody has to be accepted at the same time for us to be free. But, you know, right. so the, the thing so about- always be spraying. Yeah, 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 so that's we'll where that- speak. Yeah. And then, you know, mm -hmm. Nigerians or people from developing countries, they would be so shocked to know there are bed bugs in New York City. We expect this place to be a kind of a heaven on earth. And that's how the media has portrayed it. This is the, you know, Times Square is the square worldwide. If you come to New York and you don't get to Times Square, you come to, you've not been to New York, you know? So to see this kind of thing happen very close to Times Square and to see that those buildings around Times Square, some of them had no elevators, that was a big shock to me. How am I going to climb with my grocery? You know, seven, seven staircases, it's like climbing a ladder. Whereas, you know, um, story buildings in my place, 
the each between each floor you have two flights of stairs. You go this way, you go this way to help you with the gradient. I was climbing this way and to the seventh floor, you know, with my backs. I had to, I had to, each time I was going downstairs, there were days I wasn't going downstairs. It was too much work. I did not expect New York to be like this at all. So I was bent on poking fun on some of these things. And yeah, so I yeah. mean, you cover like so many different, all the little nuances and, and, and quirks <laughs> of, of being, um, living and working in New York. So um, I know that a lot of, um, you know, writers always want to know about process. Um, you know, what is, what is the writer's process? And so I think we have time for like this last question. So um, are you a day person, a night person? Um, do you write oh, long night do you write on your computer, music, no music? Or do you put like a revolver on the table like Hemingway did? Like, what is your process? I'm a night person. Um, this is like, Evening, this is like uh, morning for me. I'll soon begin to work all night. That's how I operate. Donna is so bad that if I want to drive 10 hours, I actually wait till 7 p.m. Then I start driving because that's when I'm most awake. <laughs> wow. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I can't, I can't, I'm not a morning person either. Like I don't function well. Yeah. Um, in, in a creative way that in, in the morning, but like, yeah. um, you know, um, a lot of, it's a, a lot of beginning writers, you know, they always say, um, you know, they, they, they want to write, but they can't find the time. And how am I going to do that? So, I mean, you're teaching, you're racking up all of these awards. Um, how do you balance, um, writing, teaching, and just living? How do, how do you balance it all out? How do you make time um, for your, for your, for your creativity? Yes, I, it's a concern and I can hear the beginning writers very clearly, um, especially when you are beginning and you don't even know whether the book would be published. You still need to have a job that does what jobs do. Uh, you know, gives you money for feeding, for rent and all of that. Um, for these beginning writers, I say, especially if you are still very young, if you are not yet 40. I used to work at night. So I'll go to my day work in the day, drink a lot of coffee, find time to nap. And then when I came back, I'll write, say three times a week, I'll write from 10 to four in the morning. And then I go work. I'll do it like, like Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, um, so that I can, Recorporate. Okay, that's what I was doing. I was also in the seminary training for the priesthood when I started to write. Um, it was very brutal. Um, and seminary authorities are not there to teach you how to write or to take your writer's bullshit. They are there to teach you how to be a priest. So you, if you show up there and begin to, to talk about uh, writing, they'll think it's a very serious distraction, okay? So I had to hide it from them for a while and learn how to write. I had to. Um, so, and I would tell my family so what's members- what's next for you? What's, what are you working on now? I, I don't know yet what I'm working on. I'm still recovering. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not like you who writes every day, every day, every day. In one week, you have released a book. So some of us have to recover a bit. Um, so I was going to say to the young, you know, to the person who asked this question, if you look at your day very carefully, there are moments you can capitalize on, but you have to make this conscious. Cut out a lot of partying. You know, explain to just a few friends just a few friends, they will understand. A lot will not understand. Cut a lot of parties out, um, prioritize your dream. Um, you know, you, you will realize sometimes you, you talk two hours on the phone with people. The, those two hours could go into writing. Your close friends will understand what has taken hold of you. 
you know, you have vacation, you know, uh, look for a place to hide and write. And when you want to cho choose a life companion, choose someone who agrees with this, your dream. Because someone who will help you take care of the children from time to time. Um, and so you can, so look for snippets of time and keep jotting things down. Uh, there's no time is not really an excuse, I have to say. I've had people come to me and say, oh, um, I would have been a writer if I had time. I would have been a writer. Why don't you just congratulate me and go? Why are you telling me you could have? So it means I have nothing doing with my life. I could have been a writer if I had time. I could have been a writer. And then someone say, I have a story to write because I have no time. See? So if it is important to you, you mustn't be a writer, but if it is important to you, like any other thing that is important to you, you try to make time for it. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, thank you so very, very much, UM. Um, I still had tons of other questions, but I think we're sort of like just about out of time. Um, but I really love your work. Um, congratulations on the success of the book. Um, many, many more books for you. <laughs> before, before you go away, before you go away, Donna, okay, as my tribute to you and all those, and this center, which is in, your center is in Brooklyn, right? This, okay, let me just read this, okay? And this, part of Brooklyn was the emptiest part of NYC I had seen. I could not imagine any commercial part of Ilorin or Wari being that empty. While I could tell about Hell's Kitchen from Times Square, Chelsea, my part of New Jersey and the Bronx, I did not know what to make of where I was. It was this part of Brooklyn alone is what I'm talking about. Brooklyn is a beautiful place. This part, it was not beautiful. It was not ugly. It was not even boring. It was just Brooklyn, a place I was going with my friends. And I already loved the name, so. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, all right. I, I'll, I'll let you go with that. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. And that's all of your work. I'd love to have another conversation. Yes, we can plan it. <laughs> well, I, I want to thank, thank you, Donna. And I'm going to thank you, you as well. I, I really, I really like what you said about uh, prioritizing your dream. That is so important. And I think it's a, it's a wonderful message that I hope that emerging writers and people who aren't even writing for you to take to heart because no matter what it is you want to do with yourself, with your life, you have to um, make those important things a priority. I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. I really appreciate it. We really appreciate it at the Center for Black Literature. We've just uh, put a poll up and I would like for everyone, if you are able to take the take a poll, we would really appreciate that as well. I want to remind you uh, to encourage, I want to remind you to visit our website, centerforblackliterature.org, to find out more about our upcoming programs, such as the next National Black Writers Conference, the Beautiful Struggle, which will be taking place next year in March, March the 30th through April the 2nd, 2022. Our upcoming, our next John Oliver Killings Reading Series program will be on December 9th. We'll be hosting uh, Honoree Fanon Jeffers, and we'll be talking about her new book, uh, The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. I want to, again, thank our partners, our sponsors, African American Literature Book Club. I want to thank Amazon Literary Partnership. And I also would encourage everyone to visit our website and um, hit the donate button. All of the programs that we produce are free or of little cost. So no matter what amount of your donation you're able to contribute, we welcome it. Again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Green. Thank you, UM. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, everyone else. Have a wonderful weekend and a wonderful uh, evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, man. <laughs>